what's our theme for this year? Intimacy with God, right? Uh, part, of knowing, part of being close to God is knowing the truth. All right, so the topic for today is quest for truth. Quest for truth. And, uh, and it's found in John chapter 3, verse 1 through 15. Let's turn to John chapter 3, 1 through 15. Would you put on the PowerPoint so everybody can follow this passage from the NIV Bible? Now, how many of you made some kind of sacrifice looking for truth? How many of you made a, some kind of sacrifice in looking for truth? Because a lot of times, people, we, we take truth for granted. We take truth for granted, and we don't, we don't pursue truth like we're supposed to. Because, see, uh, because I, I suppose having, <clears throat> having the church being so... Uh, so blessed here in America. We, we don't have to make tremendous sacrifice to look for truth because you get to come to church on a regular basis without any kind of obstacles. But there are people in this world that has a hard time just to find the truth because the truth is hidden from them, all right? It, it is hard to, to know the truth. And so the, the, uh, <clears throat> today's story, in the story, we're going to be looking at a man who has, who's in a quest for truth. <clears throat> so we have three up there? Okay. So let me pray for us one more time, okay? Father God, I just pray that all of us have the heart and the desire uh, it, to seek your truth and willing to make a sacrifice to find truth, God. So right now, we just want to bless your name, allow your word and your Holy Spirit to speak to us. Speak to us. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So Neha can go to give her testimony in that same spirit. <clears throat> Here you go. <clears throat> hey, um, I wanted to tell you that uh, coming to U.S. was a life-changing experience for me. Uh, I always has this... Uh, love for God and that relationship but uh, what I found the problem earlier was like the expression of it uh, it's like not so much accepted in other religion that openly like you're in the Christian church it's like you need to worship and uh, I couldn't openly declare my love for God and uh, it's like a matter of shame. Like the people think like, what oh, are you crazy things? <laughs> like if I talk to God in my heart in front of them, they're like, who are you talking to? <laughs> so, uh, but here like we can pray and praise like this and <laughs> everybody, like it's just the loving relationship. I just love it here. I just love that, that feeling of <clears throat> God. And I can feel it here when I worship so much. Earlier, I used to cry a lot when I came here during the songs. Now, like, because I feel so much over love, like... It's on. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, the, <clears throat> like, uh, coming on me and I can express it. And now it's like more I just, ex mm, I accepted it so much. Earlier, it was like, I, I was accepting. Now I accept it. And so now it's all joy, joy, joy so much. I love it. And uh, I'm blessed because uh, I have been baptized by B because she's the person who I first met here, um, like coming in, just first Indian I met here, uh, like just in coming like first 10 days. In, I landed and in first 10 days I met B. And that very same day she invited me to the church and that very same evening I met James and Helen. <laughs> so, <laughs> the most two important, most important couple in my life. <laughs> so uh, they just let me, uh, B's life speaks to me like more than anything but convinced me into Christianity and the love of God. It's like her living, her living life. Praise like God. went to her home, going to the, in the, uh, coming here in the car with them and Bala and I can see that the way they live, it's, it's the living testimony and you cannot, cannot, cannot not accept it and not see it and that's the best way. That's the best way to show the world, yes. be the living yeah. testimony. Yeah. That's what yeah. I want to be. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. All right. Huh? Oh, you're done? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. We're going to look at an example of another person who's uh, his testimony as well. His, uh, <clears throat> his example. All right. So let's read verse 1 together. <clears throat> Chapter 3, 
chapter, chapter 3, verse 1. I'm losing my voice. I got water ready. <clears throat> All right, verse 1 says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jew... Let's read it together. One time. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Stop right there. All right. Um, the question I want to ask is, what kind of a person will be looking for truth? What kind of a person will be looking for truth? Because obviously someone who doesn't know the truth, someone who doesn't know any better, who doesn't know anything, will want to look for the truth, right? Isn't that true? Because up to now, from John, uh, John chapter 1 and 2, we've seen what kind of people come to the Lord. Who, who have we seen so far come to the Lord? Come on, you guys know the story, right? Who came to the Lord? Peter, uh, Andrew, right? And, and, and John, right? I mean, these guys, what, what are they? What they? What's their background? They're fishermen. Are, are they well-educated? No, they're, they're not well-educated. They're probably considered the, the, the lower class, okay, if there's such a thing in people, because we do classify people, don't, don't we? All right? So they're not so educated. They don't have a position necessarily. They're, they're not in position of leadership, okay? So these, these guys wouldn't, wouldn't need the truth, right? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you think? Yeah, it's rational. It's, it makes sense. Okay, but here in chapter 3, in the early part of this chapter, we see verse 1 giving us a background of a man. His name is Nicodemus. All right? Nicodemus. What, what do we know about him? He is a, he's a Pharisee. He's a Pharisee and a member of the what? Jewish ruling council. Now, these two clues tells us a lot about this man, actually. Being a Pharisee, he is definitely well-educated. He's considered a kind of a PhD. All right, he's very well-educated, probably multiple PhDs. And then he's also a person of faith. All right, now, if somebody doesn't have faith to believe in God, it's natural, but this person already got faith. He's got religion. In the world's eyes, he's got all the answers about life. In fact, he's probably someone who teaches other people about the meanings of life. Think about that. Okay? So he has religion, he has education, and he has a certain status in the society. What do we know? Because as a Pharisee, he's already a teacher. Not only that, but he's also a high-ranking officer in the religious system. Okay? He's part of the ruling council member. So what do we find here? We find a man who's educated, who's got a certain status, a, a certain position in the society. He's probably wealthy, and he's also a religious person. Okay? And he, being a Pharisee, they're very strict in the way they live their life. Think about that for a second. Who would come and look for the truth? Who is someone that would look for the truth? We found, we found the fishermen looking for the truth, but we also see this man who is educated, who is willing to come, who has a status to come. So you see the contrast. You see the contrast. But see, um, for most of us who, who, who like to think in strategy, you know, about gospel and so forth, you, you'll probably want to think, like, Jesus, why didn't you go to people like them, like Nicodemus, right away. Instead, you went to the fishermen first. Jesus, why didn't you go after the middle upper class? Because these people has got the influence, they got the money, they can probably bring a lot of people to Christ. Come on, think about it. Everything that we do requires money, isn't it? Why, could, why didn't Jesus just go become a moral strategist and go after these kind of people, middle upper class folks? But instead, Jesus went to the poor, the uneducated, and share the gospel with them. Why? Why? Because I think for the rich, for the educated, and for those people with a status, there's a certain basic requirement for them to come to find truth. There's some basic requirements required for them. All right? And uh, we, we're going to find that in the next few verses. Uh, actually, let's read verse, verse 2. All right? <clears throat> Can we all read it together? Verse 2 says, He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, 
We know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. The first thing we notice about this man is that he came to Jesus, what time? Middle of the night, okay? Night time. Now, why would he want to come to look for Jesus at night? He, he, so he could not be seen. Uh, it's very, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, p possibilities why he did not come to see Jesus during the day. Uh, I, I think the most compelling reason is that he, he has a certain reputation to keep, okay? Because other people in the Pharisees' sect, other people in the ruling councils are there looking. They're looking. Uh, okay, and uh, Rabbi Jesus come into town, and he is kind of radical. He is kind of extreme, and, and for you to relate with Jesus, it means a little bit of trouble, all right? So being a person with a little reputation, he went to look for Jesus. Now, I can tell you, he valued his reputation. How many of you value your reputation? Come on. Yeah, you, you care, right? You care about your reputation, but he... Even though he valued his reputation, but he did not stop him. That did not stop him from visiting Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? Even though he came at night kind of respecting the opinions of other people. But meanwhile, he did not allow that to stop him. Because so many other people have the same thoughts, same feelings about Jesus among the Pharisees. But they allow their reputation or because of their certain status to stop them from visiting Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? Some people did not want to uh, find the truth or, or you know, expose themselves to the truth because their, their reputation kind of is getting in the way. You know, in the Chinese or Asian culture, we call it shame or face, you know, because you don't want to lose face. Because you don't want to lose face, and therefore what? You don't do certain things. But this man, even though he's trying to keep his reputation, his, his face, but then you know what? He's not so afraid of losing it, and he still went. He still went, all right? So he went at night. And the second thing we notice about this guy is he calls Jesus a rabbi. All right, what does rabbi mean? A teacher, a teacher, all right? W what is a Pharisee? Are they, aren't they all rabbis as well? They are. Okay, so being a teacher, being a rabbi himself, he is willing to learn. Now, when I say something like that, uh, I, I, I meant something behind it, don't I? As a teacher, as a teacher, he's willing to learn. You know, a lot of people, because they have such a high education, they feel like they're the only ones that can teach other people. They're, they're, they're the ones who's the one doing the lecture all the time. They feel like they're the ones who knows everything, and they don't need to learn anymore, okay? So being a, an, an educated person, he is he's regarded as someone who gives solution, but he's, he's humble enough to come before the Lord to learn, calling Jesus the rabbi, a rabbi calling someone else a rabbi. Now, who is someone who doesn't know anything? Someone who doesn't know anything is someone, someone who thinks they know everything. You know? The person who thinks they know everything is someone who doesn't know anything. Because the more you learn, the more you realize what you don't know. See, the more we learn, the more we realize how much more we don't know. <laughs> See, the more educated you become, the more you, you have a greater capacity to learn greater things, isn't it? So, so a true educated person, if they have the right attitude, would be someone who continues to learn and, and admits to themselves that there is someone greater. Acknowledging God. Acknowledging Jesus as rabbi. See, a lot of people, they, don't, they think they know it all. So, they, so every time they go into a situation, they don't feel like they can learn anything from anybody. Now, that person doesn't know anything. Really. Okay? And when that person, once that person learns a bit about what they don't know, they begin a true quest for truth. Truth.
So what are some of the basic fun fundamentals for looking for truth, at least for this man? He value his reputation, but he's not afraid to lose his reputation. Number two, he is a rabbi, but he's continue a learner, a teacher who is a learner. The third thing is that now being, a, being someone of that position, a, a, you know, a part of the Sanhedrin, the uh, uh, Jewish ruling council, he has a responsibility to uphold the truth, isn't he? He is the one who, to uphold the truth. Yet, he's not afraid to acknowledge that he could be wrong. See? You know, those of us who, who study a little bit of theology, this is what you learn in seminary, is that, is that there is no capital T in theology among men. Because every one of us turns to the person next to you and say, you have a theology. Yes, theology is the study of God, and every one of us has a certain perspective about God, even if you never went to seminary. Every one of us have a certain perspective above God. Some of, some of uh, you know, the people out there are atheists. Some people are you know, polytheists. Some people are monotheists. Some people have a certain thing they believe in about Jesus. They, they, something they believe about the Holy Spirit. You know, they have, everybody's got a certain perspective about God. And that's a theology. And we, the reason we call it, a, nobody has a capital T in theology. It means that every one of us could be wrong. Turn to the person next to you and say, you can be wrong. Can, can you say that about yourself? I can be wrong. You know, many of us hold our theology so sacred and say, you know what? I'm the only one who's right. <laughs> can, can, you, can, you, can you be bold enough to say that? I'm the only one who's right. Got, you got to follow my way. I'm the only way. Whoa, where did that come from? Can anybody say that? No. See, if anybody who claims to have that capital T in theology, they have to be God. That person has to be God. Right? His way is the only way. Now, for us being the leader in the church, we have a responsibility to, to uphold the truth. But whenever I engage the Bible, whenever I engage in a dialogue with another person about God, I'm always open to the possibility that I can be wrong. I can be wrong. No matter how strong a persuasion, strong, how strong a position I feel about certain things about God, I can be wrong. Turn to the person next to you and say, I can be wrong. We need to have that kind of attitude to pursue the truth. In our quest for truth, you gotta, gotta accept the fact that it's possible, highly probable, and in fact, most of the times, I am wrong about what I know. Can we have that kind of attitude? Nicodemus did, I think he did. He came because he saw something in Jesus that he's never seen before, and that kind of broke some of his ideals about traditions, about his values of religion, and certain things about what Jesus was doing that didn't make sense to him. Jesus broke his religious paradigm about faith. So being someone who is the guardian of truth he is willing to admit that he can be wrong. That's powerful stuff. And the next thing is that he talks about Jesus performing signs and doing you know, things that uh, other people could not do. He said, if God were not with you, you could not have performed these kind of signs and wonders, these miracles. And most of those things really broke their traditions uh, uh, and their, uh, all their Rituals that they passed down for generation after generation. You know that? Jesus healed on Sabbath. That's, that's, that's wrong to their, to their faith. Jesus did a lot of things that was not acceptable to the Jewish tradition. You know, why do we hold our tradition so sacred sometimes that, that we even... 
insult the people, insult the people or inflict, uh, afflict the people that's performing those signs or those things. But my friends, every tradition are to be challenged. Somebody tell me, amen. amen. Every, every tradition has to be challenged, whether or not God is in it, because every tradition, in, at least in faith, came from the Lord, I believe. I believe they came, from, they came from the Lord. But you know what? Once they become so, uh, you know, so detached from the root, from the purpose, we forget the meaning of that tradition. Once we, we, you know, after several generations, after it's passed down a few, you know, a few years or a couple, you know, uh, 20, 30, 40, 100 years later, we lose the meaning behind the tradition. And once the meaning is lost, why are we still doing it? If God is not in it, a sign from God, a miracle, is what God is doing now. But see, people celebrate Passover. The Jews celebrate Passover. What, what was Passover back then when it first started? It was a sign from God. It was a sign from God. And they celebrated Passover over and over again, and they lose the meaning of Passover, and they even look at today's sign and overlook God at work. See? God could be at work today and he could break all the traditions of the past. He could. We need to learn to respect God at work. Being a, a someone who upholds traditions, we must be willing to accept challenges from God for today, for this generation. What do you think God is doing and God is saying today? We're, we're not gathering as a church constantly to be reminded of the past what God has been doing, has done in the past. But we need to be reminded today what God is doing in this church today. Come on, you guys. What is God doing in your life today? You need to know what that is. Don't be always celebrating the past. The past is great, but God has something for you today. Today. So look at this guy. This guy came at night called Jesus a rabbi, acknowledged that he is a teacher from the Lord, acknowledging the miracles he's performing. There are four different areas that he's being challenged. He, he's not afraid to lose his reputation. He's not afraid to, to continue to learn, even though he is an educated man. He is someone, even though he is responsible, but he is not afraid to be wrong. He's not afraid to take challenges in his own faith, in his own religion. You see that? That is a person in the quest for truth. That is someone in the quest for truth. Now, when you come to church on Sunday morning, what kind of attitude did you come with? Now, some people say, I will not do that. Some people allow their reputation, how they feel, get in the way of getting baptized. You know what I'm talking about? Some people allow the, the kind of, you know, their, their feelings about who they are get in the way of faith in true encounter with God. Some people don't. Don't want to risk. Some people don't want to uh, dismiss some of the things that they believed and, and, and allow that to be challenged. So they never experience more of God. I'm always this way. This is who I am. I just want to be like this. I can tell you, you can be absolutely wrong about that. You don't have to be like this. You can move on. You can experience something anew. I can tell you, being Nicodemus, he has plenty of people telling him that he is a great guy, doing great things. In fact, he is very valuable in the community. He's part of the Jewish ruling council. How much higher can you go in our society? This is the man that, was, that had, a, he, he was on a journey for truth. He was on a journey for truth. Turn to the person next to you and tell them to get started. Get started. Get started. All right. 
So let's look at verse 3 to 9, okay? And, and because I, I want to cut this today's message short so we get to uh, celebrate with our uh, people who got baptized and take pictures with them because that's so important. <laughs> yes, of course, celebrating. Okay, so verse 3 through 9, okay? So let's read this together. Jesus replied, everybody, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. Okay. Um, I mean, we can spend a lot of time just on these verses, talking about the difference between water baptism and, uh, and the Spirit baptism. You know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, how we have baptism today when we're talking about this passage? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I mean, we, we look for a specific day that fits everything, our schedule for, for baptism. And it turns out to be this day. And look at this passage was picked. When was this? Last year. Last year. This passage all broke down based, based on last year. And it turns out that we're talking about baptism today. So, I mean, we could spend a lot of time talking about water baptism and baptism in the Spirit. But I just want to do some very simple observation here, Okay. The quest for truth, what is the truth? The truth is about a new life, isn't it? Isn't that what this passage is talking about? This passage is talking about a brand new life. A lot of people have a misconception about truth. They think truth is about some teaching, having some right ideas, or some right formulation of some ideas. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Some people actually believe, okay, the, the truth is about what I know, something we know. But the Bible is clearly teaching us the truth is about, it's about life. It's about life. It's not about what you know. You can walk around and boast of how much you know, but I can tell you it's useless. Not for, not for Christianity. Okay? It's not how much you know. It's how much, how much you live. All right? So the truth is about this new life. And I, I just want to summarize and give like, three simple points from this, these verses. Three very simple points. And I think it ca encapsulates the key points uh, in these verses. The first point is, is that this new life has to do with the kingdom. Don't you agree? It, it says, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he, they are born again. And he talks about it uh, again. It talks about the kingdom. Okay, uh, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. So when Nicodemus came to visit Jesus, Jesus interpreted, hey, you want to find the truth, I can tell you that the truth is about entering into the kingdom. Are you with me? It's about entering into the kingdom. Turn to the person next to you, it's about entering the kingdom. Okay, the Bible is clearly guiding us this way. Jesus in his teaching is guiding us this way. It's always about the kingdom. When Jesus first came out to preach the gospel, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, is at hand. All right, people think about knowing the truth is about coming to the church. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Some people think, you know, knowing the truth is about coming to church. Uh, how about going to heaven? Yeah, some people think the, the, knowing the truth is about going to heaven, right? And, and uh, to have eternal life, right? The, these th three things kind of encapsulate most, most Christians' ideas or ideals about becoming a Christian. To be a Christian, to have the truth is what? To go to church, to go to heaven, and to have eternal life. Isn't that true? But the Bible clearly teaches us that it's not about that. It's actually about the kingdom. And, and what is the kingdom? Kingdom is the rule and reign of God. The rule and reign of Christ in our lives. The rule and reign of 
God ministering his authority through us in everything we do. And that's why we, we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. So, so God's kingdom from heaven comes to earth, living here on earth, this kingdom. It's not about going to church. Maybe coming to church is one thing. It's part of, part of that expression of the kingdom. But it's not about the church. It's about the kingdom. It is not about this heaven that we go to. It's about here and now. Because if it's all about heaven, I can tell you, everybody here on earth, all the Christians are here waiting to die. Do you understand? We're all waiting so that we can go to heaven. Is that true? And that's why the, the you know, the, the Waco, Texas, Davidian compound and David Koresh and those kind of crazy guys, they, they tell everybody come into the church and let's burn this place down. Let's all commit suicide, mass suicide together. Go to see the Lord. If, if our faith is about us going to heaven, why not sooner? Hello? Does it make sense? Why not sooner than later? But that's not what's about. If the God has a mission for us, it's about the kingdom. It's about here and now. Some people think about eternal life. But I can tell you, eternal life is not so much about the duration of time that you're going to live, but eternal life is the quality of life. It's, a, it's the eternal quality lived out here on earth. You understand? Eternal life is about the kind of, how, how can we live the life that is beyond time and space here, limited by time and space? That is the life of Jesus Christ. So that's what, uh, the first thing that we notice about this passage, it's about the kingdom. And the second thing, it, it very, very important, without going to so much the detail, but I think we can all agree, no matter how, how kind of, what kind of interpretation you have about the water and the spirit, baptism and so forth, without going into so much detail, but the Bible, the Bible is clear, this life has to do with the spirit of God. Do you agree? Yes. Because it, it, it came from the Spirit of God. This life came from the Spirit. Without Spirit, without the Spirit of God, you have no life. Turn to the person next to you. Say, without Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, you have no life. It has nothing to do, has nothing to do with how much Bible you memorize. Come on. All right? Tell the person next to you. It doesn't, doesn't matter how much you memorize in the Bible. Okay? It has nothing to do with that you pray the sinner's prayer. Come on. All right? It's not a magic formula. By saying these things, by saying these things, uh, pray a certain prayer, okay? And because I, I know there's a lot of religion out there that they pray certain prayers, you know, with the little bees and so forth. I mean, all kinds of religions do all kinds of things, religious things. By saying the right things doesn't, doesn't save you. It comes with what? It comes with the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you have no new life. Because no matter what you know, what you learn, you're still yourself unless God enter in. Somebody say amen. amen. Without the Spirit of God, you still have the old life. And that's not going to be enough to enter. All right? So it's about, it's about the Spirit of God coming into you and having this new life. Yeah. All right. And the th third thing I want to conclude from this, this passage is new life has, has changes. Do you, do you believe that? It comes with changes. If you look at this passage, verse 8 says, what does it say? The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. It, it, it says that the Holy Spirit come, you, you have no control over it. It's just like the wind. You can't control where it comes from or where it's going. You can't control it. The Holy Spirit comes into your life and things just happen. Things happen when the Holy Spirit comes. There, things going to have to change. Some people believe in the Holy, Holy Trinity. You know, God is, God cannot be changed. He's, he's Alpha and Omega. He doesn't change, right? Im, Im, immovable, unchangeable God, right? Some people believe in that about themselves. They, they, they believe that, that they, they are just like the Holy Trinity that cannot be changed. What I used to be, what I am today, I am, will always be like this tomorrow. You know, they, they believe how they used to be is just, just, just the same. Today and tomorrow, we're going to be the same. I, I'm going to stay the same. 
I can tell you, you're not living this kind of life that the Bible is talking about, if that's what you believe about yourself. The Bible is clearly teaching us that whenever you have this new life, okay, if you have this new life, you will change. You will change. Things will happen. I mean, when I first, um, I, I gave this testimony earlier in the last service, uh, when I was 15 years old, and I, and I for the first time, experienced the fullness of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit, okay? And before that, I was a believer. I mean, I, I was baptized. I was baptized in the church when I was 12 years old, and for three years, I went to church. I did all the, all the religious things that you do at a church. Come on, somebody say amen. Some of you have done that all your life, you know? <laughs> go to Sunday school, go to Bible study, go to, some of you joined the choir. You ever been to choir? I, I was in the choir. And, uh, and then, you know, all the Sunday service and, and everything, you know, memorize scriptures and all that. Man, I tell you, I didn't have the life without the Spirit. And then when I, when I came back from a retreat where I experienced the Holy Spirit in my life, you know what happened? The first thing I noticed was that my sister said something about me differently. Because be before, before um, they used to describe me as the volcano. You know what a volcano is? You know, what is it? What is a volcano? Volcano erupts, all right? See, because I, I used to have this problem. My problem was I, I did not know how to communicate how I feel. And a lot of things got bottled up inside, everything, okay? Uh, and, and I was very frustrated. I didn't know how to communicate with other people about how I feel. And I'm, a, I'm afraid to get too emotional about certain things, so I bottle everything up inside. And then every time somebody says something, okay, that, that is inappropriate to me, <laughs> I just blow up, okay, like a volcano. So, you know, do you feel bad when you blow up? Who, who, who feels the worst when you, who, when you blow up? You do, okay? When you blow up, you feel the worst, all right? So I feel bad whenever I blow up, and then I feel sorry that it happened, but it happened already. And it's hard to clean up after a big mess. What do you do, you know? But when God came into my life, the Holy Spirit came into my life, transformation began to take place. It wasn't intentional. It was like, oh, James, I need to work harder. I'm going to have to change. I'm going to be a better person now. I'm not going to blow up anymore. You know what? The more you suppress yourself, the more it's going to happen, right? Somebody say amen. Come on, the more you stop yourself from doing the wrong thing, the more, <laughs> the more mistake you make, you know. Okay, it's, when you know it's not you at work and the Holy Spirit is at work. And my sister said to me, James, you've changed. And that's when I noticed I've changed. I, I didn't notice anything changed. See, because people's gonna see the wind blow and then things start changing. And so the life in the spirit is a life of transformation. You cannot be the same yesterday, today, and forever because that's God. You're not God. Tell the person next to you, you're not God. You're not God. So therefore, you have to change. Why? Because when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you're changing for the better, more and more like Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. All right? And that's the work of God inside of our lives. So these three very basic principles, first of all, it's about the kingdom. It's about the kingdom. The truth is about the kingdom. And second thing is that your, your life comes from the spirit. They, they're not come from just reading the word. I mean, maybe the word can help you opening up for the spirit of work, but it requires the Holy Spirit come into you. You know, the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and begin a brand new birth. And that is the life of a Christian, all right? And then the third thing is that when you have these two things, the kingdom, the Holy Spirit, boom, transformation start taking place. Now, some of you may be starving and say, man, I've been a Christian for a long time, and I need a change. Come on, somebody say amen. Okay, I need a change. If you need a change, today is a good, as good as any other day. Amen? I mean, you see somebody getting baptized, okay? Why, why, did they get, why did they get baptized? Why did they want to get baptized? Why? Well, because they witnessed a change. There is a change in their life, right? Why would you want to be baptized? 
because you're witnessing God's work in your life. In our baptism class, we, we talked about three very simple things to write down in your, in your uh, testimony. Three things. The first thing, first thing is how you were before. Second thing is God, how, what, how God came into your life. Okay? And the third thing is what kind of transformation took place. Simple. That's a testimony. Testimony is very simple. What is God doing in you? And, and a lot of people have, have very little testimony to share about. Why? They always talk about what happened with other people. There's something wrong when you talk about other people all the time. Or when you start talking about something that happened 20 years ago. Oh, 20 years ago. <laughs> what is God doing now? What is God doing now? So let's go to verse 10 through 13 right now. 10 through 13. Let's move up the PowerPoint a little bit, 10 through 13. Verse 10 says, uh, everybody read together with me. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Pause right there. Pause right there. Now, without going too much into the details of this passage, I just want to say that Jesus wants us to understand the truth is a life that came from heaven. That came from heaven. That is to be lived out here on earth. See, he is saying clearly, see, how can you understand all this? if you only think about earthly things. Because the only way to understand what Jesus is teaching here is to understand this is not something off earth. Something here in this world. It's not from this world. It's from God's world. It's from heaven. This heavenly principle is here on earth. You have to accept a brand new way of thinking, a brand new paradigm. Nicodemus has been a teacher. He's been a teacher and a philosopher about life on earth. If you are to argue and, and talk about life and principles of a life, he can, he's probably one of the best guys to talk to. But when it comes to talking about heavenly things, you've got to go to the right source. There's only one man that came from heaven that continued to rule and reign. And that is Jesus. Jesus is the only one. No one else on earth has ever done this. And that's why we go to Jesus. Because he is our only source to the heavenly knowledge. And that's what he's exposing to us right now. He's teaching us that. It is about a heavenly life living here on earth. Lived out here on earth. And the, and the last two verses, I'm going to try to wrap up is, uh, let's look at verse 14 and 15. Let's read together. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Just like what, what took place in the desert for the Israelites to understand this principle. The Israelites were, were sinning before God, and, and God sent serpents to, to just irritate them and, and bite them and, and many were dying and that's when Moses interceded on behalf of the Israelites and, and God told them to make this bronze snake. Anyone who gaze upon a bronze snake on a pole will be saved. They'll be healed. Okay? And, and I wondered about that for the longest time. Why do you want to look at a stupid bronze snake to be healed? Why? I can tell you. It's obedience and belief. Simple. The same way, it's illustrating Christ who died on the cross. All you have to do is look upon the cross by faith. Believe. See, verse 15 tells us that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. 
It's by faith we enter. It is by faith we enter into this life. You can't enter any other way. You can't reason your way. You can't buy your way. You can't get a diploma in this. You got to have faith. And by believing, you walk into this path of truth, of life. And so today,